And now for something completely different. We're going to have a look at blood. What you're seeing in this image is human blood as it appears under the light microscope. And you'll have a chance to look at your own blood in the lab. We're seeing lots of red blood cells or erythrocytes. And of course, they're going to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then we have a number of white blood cells or leukocytes. In this image, we have two neutrophils, one eosinophil, one monocyte, one basophil, and one lymphocyte. Now, no doubt that doesn't mean a whole lot to you just yet, but it will. So stay tuned and we will talk about what each of those cells do. Let's start with a brief introduction to the circulatory system. And instead of jumping right into the human system, let's start with the fish. Why fish? Well, it's quite fascinating. And also fish are a bit simpler. They have a circulatory system that has to do everything our circulation needs to do, but they do have a lower metabolic rate and the demands of the tissues are not as great as we see in a mammal like ourselves. So a fish has a heart that has two chambers. We of course have four chambers in our heart. In the fish heart, we have the atrium that receives deoxygenated blood from the body. And then we have the ventricle that's going to force blood towards the gills. In between the atrium and the ventricle, we have a valve that prevents blood from flowing in the wrong direction. At the gills, the blood is going to dump off carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. The blood is then going to travel to the systemic capillary beds. This is a network of fine blood vessels that will supply nutrients and oxygen to the tissues. So we could be talking about muscle or nervous tissue or the liver, etc. At the same time, um, carbon dioxide will be released from these cells into the blood so that it can be taken back through the heart and back to the gill capillaries. So it doesn't matter what type of organism we're talking about, circulation plays the same critical roles. We have transportation. So we have transportation of nutrients from the digestive system. We have transportation of oxygen from the gills or lungs to the tissues that need it. We have transportation of waste products and transportation of carbon dioxide, which is also a waste product that needs to be removed from the body. We have regulation. So mixed in with the blood are hormones and other signaling molecules that bring about changes throughout the body and help maintain homeostasis. And we also have protection. So we'll talk about the immune system a little bit in this course. We'll talk about it more in microbiology. But of course, we have cells that help protect us from foreign invaders. And we have compounds within our blood that will help protect us from disease and also from toxins. I really can't stress enough the importance of the circulatory system. It connects all of the other organ systems together. You are essentially a colony of 100 trillion or more cells, and those cells don't have access to oxygen directly. They don't have access to food directly. So we need this transport system to bring them the things that they need and get rid of the waste products of those cells. I talked about before the idea that you are basically a tube within a tube. You're a meat tube that contains another tube known as the digestive system. And that system is going to collect nutrients. The nutrients are going to be transported to every single cell in your body because of course, every single cell has to undergo cellular respiration. We also have gills or lungs that are going to allow oxygen to diffuse into the blood so that it can be carried to every cell in your body once again to allow for cellular respiration. We have to get rid of carbon dioxide, which of course is a byproduct of the citric acid cycle. So that has to be removed at the lungs or gills. Then we have an excretory system as all of these trillions of cells are undergoing metabolism, they're producing waste products that we need to get rid of and we need to get them out of the body. 
So all of these systems, they are all connected together by the blood and by the circulation. It doesn't matter what kind of animal we're talking about. We could be talking about a fish. We could be talking about a human, a bird, uh, or even something like an earthworm. They have a circulation that allows all of the cells in the body to get the things they need and get rid of the things they don't. Now indulge me for a moment. I think I mentioned before that my background is comparative anatomy and also evolutionary biology. And I'm going to talk about frogs and reptiles very, very briefly here. So remember, we talked about the fish circulatory system. And in fish, we have the heart pumping blood out to the gills. Carbon dioxide is going to be dumped off. Oxygen is going to be taken in and absorbed by the blood. The blood is then going to flow to systemic capillaries, body capillaries, where oxygen is released and carbon dioxide is picked up. Back to the heart and then back to the gills. So we have a simple loop occurring. Now in other vertebrates, tetrapods, things with four limbs, we have two circuits. We have a pulmonary circuit and we have a systemic circuit. Now let's take a look at amphibians very briefly. We have a heart that consists of two atria and one ventricle. And the ventricle is not divided in the middle. So we have a three chambered heart. Blood is going to be pumped out to the pulmocutaneous circuit where it's gonna pick up oxygen. Now, if you remember, cutaneous refers to the skin. Frogs in the winter will hibernate at the bottom of a pond. They'll sit at the bottom of the pond and they will actually exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the water through their skin, through this circuit. Oxygenated blood is gonna come back to the heart and then it's gonna be pumped out to the systemic capillaries of the body. There's mixing of blood, of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood within the middle of the heart. That's not a big deal in amphibians because their metabolism is fairly low. They have lower oxygen requirements than something like a mammal. In reptiles, you can see that we have two separate ventricles, quite similar to what we see in mammals and birds. They do have an extra little circulation there, which is pretty cool, but I'm not gonna get into that. Next, we have mammals and birds. Mammals and birds have a four-chambered heart. They have two atria and they have two ventricles. The oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood are kept totally separate. So blood is leaving the heart, going out to the lungs, being oxygenated, coming back to the opposite side of the heart before going out to the systemic capillaries and then coming back to the heart. So in mammals like ourselves and in birds that have even higher metabolism than we do, they have a higher metabolic rate, we don't have a mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. We also have a higher blood pressure than most other vertebrates. The circulatory system in vertebrates is a closed system. And what I mean by that is the blood is always contained within vessels or chambers. So blood leaves the heart, it goes out through arteries and then arterioles and then into a capillary. It leaves the other side of that capillary bed still traveling through a little tube and it's recollected into venules and then veins and then returns to the heart. The blood is always gonna be enclosed by a chamber of some sort or vessel. It's never gonna be free to simply seep between the cells of a tissue. That's not the case in invertebrates. In most invertebrates, the fluid that leaves the heart is going to actually seep between the tissues and then eventually be recollected back into the heart so it can be pumped through the body. That's a fairly slow process in invertebrates. Having blood always travel through tubes speeds things up quite a bit and means that vertebrates can supply more oxygen and metabolites to the cells in their body and supply them at a higher rate. However, the plasma, the fluid portion of the blood can leave through these vessels, especially capillaries. Capillaries are rather leaky to this fluid. 
So what you're seeing here, we have blood coming in at the left of this diagram, and this is oxygenated blood. It's going to lose that oxygen as it passes through a capillary bed, and it's also going to pick up carbon dioxide, and then the blood will leave on the right, and it will return back to the heart. The blood that's coming in on the left is under pressure, so fluid will seep out through the capillaries, and that'll seep into the interstitial fluid, the fluid that bathes the cells, the fluid that's found around the cells. On the other side of the capillary bed, fluid is going to move back in. It's going to be recollected by the circulatory system. However, it's important to note that not all of that fluid is recollected. Some of that fluid that seeped out and became interstitial fluid won't be recollected by the circulatory system. Instead, it's going to be recollected by the lymphatic system, which we'll talk about in a later topic. That forms a fluid known as lymph, and then the lymphatic system will eventually return that fluid back to the blood flow. Blood is a sticky, opaque fluid with a metallic taste. It tastes metallic because it contains metal, it contains iron. There's not a ton of iron in your body. If you were to take all of the iron within your body and condense it down, you'd have enough to form a small nail. You could hang a pitcher, basically. But that iron does something really special. It binds to oxygen. If we look at the hemoglobin within your red blood cells, each hemoglobin molecule has four iron atoms and each one of those iron atoms will bind to one molecule of oxygen. The color of blood varies from scarlet, so very bright intense red, if the blood is oxygenated, to dark red if the blood is deoxygenated. Now I remember when I was in grade seven, we had this school play that we were performing, cats actually, and our art teacher was building the sets and he was up on stage and we were helping him out and he stepped on a board with a nail and the nail went right through his foot and I remember him taking off his shoe and taking off his sock and bleeding a remarkable volume of blood forming this big pool of blood on the stage and I remember watching it and seeing it turn from dark red to scarlet as it became oxygenated. That might be a bit of a morbid memory, but uh, it was kind of interesting to see. Anyway, moving along and forgetting I mentioned any of that, the pH of blood is slightly alkaline. So it's not quite neutral, it's a little bit basic. Also note that blood accounts for approximately 8% of the body weight. So we do have quite a bit of fluid there. The average volume of blood is five to six liters for males and four to five liters for females. But of course, this is going to vary depending on body size. And body size will be the main determinant of how much blood you possess. The fluid portion of the blood is known as the plasma. It's aqueous, which means it's water-based, and it contains a lot of solutes. Solutes are things that are dissolved in a solvent. So we have proteins, for instance. We have albumin, which is a protein that can be shipped throughout the body to serve as a metabolite. It can be broken down as an energy source. We have globulins. So immunoglobulins are antibodies. They're used to recognize foreign proteins and stimulate a response from the immune system that will remove foreign cells and foreign toxins. We have clotting proteins. Clotting proteins are going to help seal up gaps in tissue and prevent blood loss through the skin, for instance. We have toxic waste. We have materials that need to be removed. Lactic acid needs to be broken down and lactic acid and lactate will be converted by the liver into sugar, which is something that's more useful. Remember, we talked about how lactate is produced by muscle cells that are undergoing anaerobic respiration. We have urea and creatinine, which we'll come back to later, but these are other toxic products that need to be removed by the kidneys. We have nutrients. 
that have been absorbed through the small intestine mainly. Things like glucose and disaccharides and other carbohydrates and amino acids. We have electrolytes. We're talking mainly here about ions of sodium, potassium, calcium, etc. that are needed by nerve cells and muscle cells. We also have respiratory gases. So oxygen needs to be transported to tissues that need the oxygen and carbon dioxide needs to be removed. Suspended within the plasma are the formed elements of the blood. These are cells and fragments of cells. So we have the erythrocytes, which are the red blood cells. We have the leukocytes, which are the white blood cells, and we have platelets. Of these, only the white blood cells are complete cells. They have a nucleus and they have all the organelles you would expect to encounter in a cell. Erythrocytes have no nucleus and they have no organelles. They lose them during development. A mature red blood cell is basically just a bag of hemoglobin. And platelets, as we'll see, are just fragments of cells. The platelets are involved in clotting. Most of these formed elements are very short-lived. They need to be replaced. And they don't divide within the blood. Instead, they divide and are manufactured within bone marrow. Separating plasma from formed elements is a rather simple process. You can take your whole blood, put that into a tube, and then put that in a centrifuge. When you spin this, that causes centrifugal force, and the denser components of the blood will settle to the bottom of the tube. If you spin it long enough, you'll get a pellet at the bottom, and that pellet will be made up of erythrocytes. So red blood cells are denser than the other components of the blood. At the top of the tube, you'll have your liquid portion, known as a supernatant. That's the plasma. So we're talking here about water and, of course, a whole lot of solutes that are dissolved within that solution. In between the plasma and the erythrocytes, we will have what's known as the buffy coat, a thin layer, typically less than 1% of our entire sample, that contains leukocytes and platelets. Now, if you're fighting a rather extensive infection, you have a system-wide infection, your body will be producing a lot more leukocytes than it normally would. And that buffy coat can be noticeably thicker. Your body is approximately 8% blood by weight. The other 92% consists mainly of tissues, but also other fluids, interstitial fluids, lymph, etc. Of the blood, 55% is plasma by volume. The other 45% would be the formed elements. The plasma is mostly water, of course, but it contains some important proteins, some important electrolytes, uh, important regulatory molecules, etc. The formed elements consist mainly of erythrocytes, red blood cells. We have a lot of platelets as well, and then we have leukocytes that are divided into several subgroups, as we'll see. Now, I'm not going to ask you about numbers and percentages when it comes to what makes up the blood, but I do want you to know kind of the relative proportions. When it comes to dissolved materials, so solutes, albumins are rather important, so these are proteins. Some of them serve directly as nutritional materials for cells, but others are transport substances. They bind to hormones, they bind to amino acids, and they help them dissolve in the blood and get across plasma membranes. We have globulins, which form antibodies. We'll come back to that later, but they're involved in the immune response. We have fibrinogen. This is a glycoprotein that will bind to itself and form kind of a mesh of protein that's involved in blood clotting. We have electrolytes. They're going to maintain osmotic balance. More than that, though, we have things like calcium and sodium and so on that are very important in the conduction of action potentials in neurons and also the contraction of muscle tissue. We have nutrients that are carried from the digestive system, glucose, 
amino acids, fatty acids, a whole bunch of other things. We have gases, and the most important, of course, are carbon dioxide and oxygen. So carbon dioxide is being released as a waste product from tissues throughout the body, and that has to be taken to the lungs and gotten rid of. And then we have oxygen that has to be taken from the lungs to the tissues that need it. We have regulatory substances, hormones, insulin, glucagon, etc. Vitamins as well. Vitamins are really important for the function of enzymes. We have waste products that need to be removed from the body. So urea is a waste product of the metabolism of protein and it needs to make its way to the kidneys so that it can be removed in urine. Platelets are going to promote blood clotting. They're also going to promote the healing of tissue. White blood cells are involved in the functioning of the immune system. So if you have an infection, your body is going to be signaled to produce more white blood cells to attack that infection, attack the bacteria or whatever is causing your problems. Um, white blood cells will also attack foreign substances like toxins. Red blood cells, of course, are going to carry oxygen. They're going to transport oxygen to cells that need it. They have hemoglobin to do that. Hemoglobin contains iron that will bind to oxygen molecules. Let's take a look at the formed elements and we'll start with the erythrocytes, which are the most common. These are biconcave discs. And what that means, it's a disc that's being kind of pushed in on both sides. And what that depression does is it provides more surface area. So we want to have a large surface area so that these cells can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with their surroundings. The plasma membrane contains a protein known as spectrin, and this is a very elastic, flexible protein. And that makes sense because capillaries are very tiny, and in many cases, these cells actually have to deform and squish and change shape to fit through these tiny little tubes. Hopefully by this point you've had a chance to look at blood under the microscope in the lab and maybe made your own slides of your own blood. You would have seen something like this. Most of the formed elements are erythrocytes, red blood cells. And we have a few white blood cells thrown in as well in little fragments known as platelets. And we'll get to all those in just a moment. If you made your own wet mount slides or smears with your own blood, you would have seen that as the slide dried out, the red blood cells tend to stick together and they form structures that look like stacks of coins. Erythrocytes are essentially just bags of hemoglobin and each hemoglobin molecule consists of four parts, four polypeptides. Each one of those polypeptides has something called a heme group and at the middle of that heme group is an atom of iron. And this is where a molecule of diatomic oxygen can bind. So each hemoglobin molecule is capable of binding to four oxygen molecules. It's important to note that red blood cells can also transfer carbon dioxide throughout the body. What typically happens is that carbon dioxide is combined with water, that's converted into carbonic acid by an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase. And that's going to lead to the production of bicarbonate ion within the red blood cell. Now that can be transferred to the lungs and then the reverse can occur and we can break that down into carbon dioxide that can then be released at the lungs. Now some carbon dioxide is going to be dissolved directly into the plasma as well. So we're going to have dissolved gas within the plasma, but most of it is conducted as bicarbonate ions. We talked about this buffering reaction before, and remember if your blood becomes very acidic, then the extra protons, because remember acidity is the result of extra protons, those extra protons can be added to bicarbonate ion, that can be converted into carbonic acid, that can be converted into carbon dioxide and water, and the carbon dioxide can be released at the lungs. So if you have acidosis, which is 
acidity of the blood, what tends to happen is you start panting. You start breathing very quickly to get rid of that extra carbon dioxide. So this is a buffering reaction. It does involve the red blood cells and it will help maintain the proper pH of the blood. We also talked about the alkaline tide when we talked about the digestive system. So parietal cells within the stomach have to pump a whole lot of hydrogen protons into the stomach along with chloride to make hydrochloric acid. And that results in bicarbonate being pumped into the blood. Now this is balanced in large part by the pancreas because the pancreas is going to secrete bicarbonate. So we have all of these systems in place that will help maintain the pH of the blood and keep it just slightly alkaline. The formation of blood cells occurs through a process known as hematopoiesis. And this occurs within red bone marrow. So within the red marrow of your bones, you have stem cells known as hemocytoblasts. And these hemocytoblasts can divide by mitosis and they maintain a small resident population. Those cells as needed can become committed to developing into any of the different blood cell types. And what you're seeing at the bottom here is the production of an erythrocyte. So in this case, we start with a hemocytoblast and notice that it looks like a normal cell in that it has a nucleus and it has all the organelles we would associate with most cells. That cell is going to become committed and become a pro-erythroblast. At this point, the only thing it can become is a erythrocyte, so its fate has been determined. Now, as it starts to develop and mature into an erythrocyte, what's gonna happen is the genetic material in the nucleus is going to be decoded. So the genes are going to be transcribed into messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is gonna move out into the cytosol, bind to a ribosome, and be translated into protein. Most of the protein that's being made in this cell is hemoglobin. Because remember, the cell is going to fill up with hemoglobin. There's some other stuff though too. There are a few enzymes and so on within uh, erythrocytes. Now what happens when this hemoglobin is being produced is kind of strange. The nucleus is going to be spat out of the cell. The cell is going to eject its nucleus. Now at this point there are still messenger RNAs floating around in the cytosol and they will continue to be translated. So there are still ribosomes and there are still uh, Golgi bodies and all that kind of stuff in the cell at this stage. A reticulocyte still contains ribosomes, it still contains messenger RNA, it still contains uh, ribosomal RNA that we can stain, and this is the cell that's going to be ejected from the blood. Now, after about another day or so of circulating in the blood, it's going to break down most of those components as well, and it's gonna become a mature erythrocyte. If you look at your blood and you see that you have quite a lot of reticulocytes, that means you're currently producing a lot of red blood cells. And we'll talk about why something like that might occur. There's more information in this slide and the preceding slide than I expect you to know. I don't expect you to memorize the names of all the intermediate cells in these lineages, but I do expect you to know what a stem cell is, and I expect you to know, in a broad sense, how red blood cells develop. The fact that they fill up with hemoglobin and then spit out their nucleus. Hemocytoblasts are the population of stem cells that give rise to all our specialized cells. And of course, it's critical that we have this small population of stem cells because the specialized cells, the mature cells, things like basophils and B lymphocytes, etc., they wear out and they need to be replaced. And those cells at the bottom, those specialized cells, don't divide by mitosis. The stem cells divide by mitosis. The hemocytoblasts are not that common in the bone marrow. They make up about one in every 10,000 cells. When they divide by mitosis, one of those cells will remain as a stem cell 
and the other cell will start to specialize and start to commit to a fate. We say that these hemocytoblasts are pluripotent or they have pluripotential. Pluri means many, they can become many things. But what happens first, they start to specialize and they might become a myeloid stem cell. And now they're somewhat specialized, but not completely committed. So at this point, a myeloid stem cell can still undergo divisions and it can give rise to a smaller subcategory of cells. It can give rise to red blood cells and platelets and eosinophils and basophils and neutrophils and monocytes, but it can't give rise to uh, these other lymphocytes. So for that, we need to have these lymphoid stem cells. Now you can imagine if you have a problem with one of these subpopulations of stem cells, that might mean that you can't create certain types of blood cells. And that's what happens during leukemia, as we'll see. So if you have leukemia, you have cancer of these stem cells. They divide uncontrollably. And in fact, you end up making more blood cells than you would normally, but the blood cells aren't formed properly and they can't do their job properly. There's different types of leukemia because the cancer can occur in different populations of stem cells that have become committed in different ways. Erythropoiesis refers specifically to the formation of red blood cells. And this is a process that is regulated by a hormone known as erythropoietin. If you have hypoxia, your blood is not transporting sufficient oxygen. And there can be a couple different reasons for this. Maybe you've got a low red blood cell count, or maybe those red blood cells don't contain sufficient hemoglobin or the hemoglobin is compromised in some way. It's uh, misshapen perhaps, or it could just be that you don't have sufficient oxygen available. You're not getting it into your blood in sufficient quantities. If you have hypoxia, what's going to happen is your kidney and your liver to a lesser extent will release this hormone, this erythropoietin, and that hormone will travel through the blood to the red bone marrow and it will stimulate the bone marrow to produce and release more red blood cells. Once you have more red blood cells, hopefully you'll be able to transport more oxygen and this will bring about a homeostasis. Now, interestingly, in the past, a lot of athletes used to abuse this system for increased performance. What they would do is they would go and train at high altitude and they would train really hard and what would happen is their muscle tissues would be starving for oxygen. So their kidneys would release this hormone and that would increase their red blood cell counts. And they would do this just before they had a competition at a lower elevation. So they would move to the town that they're going to be competing in. They would have an increased red blood cell count that would last for maybe a few days. And then they could use that for increased performance because now they can carry a lot more oxygen to their tissues. This is known as blood doping. The other way to do it is to actually take some of your blood out and store it and then concentrate those red blood cells and inject them back into yourself just before a competition or a race. And this is illegal. When I say that blood doping is illegal, I am of course talking about at Olympic events and other major sporting events. But even if you're not an Olympic athlete, I don't recommend it. Having too many red blood cells can be a problem. It increases the viscosity or thickness of your blood, which increases the resistance of blood flow through blood vessels. Also, the blood cells do have to be broken down eventually. And if you have more red blood cells, you've got more waste products to deal with. So let's talk about the life cycle of a red blood cell and talk about some of the byproducts and waste products of their breakdown. Red blood cells don't stick around for very long. So after three or maybe four months, they're worn out and they need to be replaced. Remember, they lack a nucleus and they lack organelles, so they can't repair themselves very readily. What's going to happen is they're going to be gobbled up by macrophages. Macrophages are white blood cells that gobble up foreign cells like bacteria, but they also gobble up worn out or damaged cells. 
The macrophages are going to be found predominantly in the spleen, liver, and red bone marrow. They're going to take in these red blood cells and break them down. So within the macrophage, the globin, which is the protein part of hemoglobin, is going to be broken into amino acids. And the amino acids are going to be passed into the blood, and they can travel throughout the body to wherever they're needed. So those amino acids can be strung together in any sequence to make whatever protein a cell might need. Then we have the heme group. The heme, incidentally, is not a protein. It's made up of these ring structures. It's its own special kind of compound. The iron is going to be taken off of that heme group, and your body will go to great lengths to recycle that iron. There's not a lot of iron in your body, but it's very, very important, of course, so your body doesn't want to lose it. The iron is going to be stuck to a protein known as transferrin, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to act as a shuttle, basically. It's going to transport that iron within the blood, and it's going to transport it to the liver, where that iron can be used to make ferritin. And this is a storage molecule. Your liver stores quite a lot of iron. If you like to eat liver, I personally don't, you'll find that you get a lot of iron from liver. It's the highest source of iron there is, really other than sucking on a nail, I guess, which I don't recommend. The liver will store the iron if there's excess iron in the body. If your body needs more iron to make more blood, it'll dump that iron back into the blood, again, sticking it to this transferrin. The iron will find its way to red bone marrow, where it will be stuck together with globin, that's, or globin, I should say, that's been made by uh, sticking amino acids together in the right sequence and also there needs to be vitamin b12 and other vitamins to activate some of the enzymes involved but as we've talked about the red bone marrow is going to be the site of erythropoiesis which is red blood cell production okay the rest of that heme group is going to be broken down into a few waste products we've got biliverdin which is greenish in color and that will be converted into bilirubin. Bilirubin will move to the liver, so it'll be transported through the blood, and then it's going to be dumped into the duodenum. What's gonna happen is the liver will stick that bilirubin, which is a waste product essentially, into the bile. This is one of the compounds that gives bile its characteristic color. That bile, as you know, passes into the duodenum, where it's going to aid in digestion of fats. But that bilirubin will be broken down by bacteria. And the intermediate that's made by the bacteria will be transported to the kidney through the blood where it's broken down into urobilin. And urobilin is yellow. And this is the compound that gives urine its characteristic color. Some of that intermediate will remain in the small intestine where it will be broken down further into something called stercobilin. And this is brown in color. So now you know why your pee is yellow and why your poo is brown. And there's more detail here than I expect you to know once again, but bilirubin is a rather important compound and we'll come back to that in just a sec. In fact, we'll talk about it right now. Jaundice is a condition that results from a buildup of bilirubin. And you can see this individual here has a yellow tint to their skin and the whites of their eye aren't white, they're yellow. And this is due to bilirubin being deposited in those tissues. There's two ways that this might occur. We might have a malfunction of the liver. So remember the liver should be taking bilirubin out of the blood and then dumping it into the bile to get rid of it. If the liver is not doing that fast enough, then we'll get a buildup of bilirubin in the blood and that will lead to the deposition of bilirubin in tissues like skin. This is something that happens in newborns as well. And it's typically not something to be too concerned about. It's quite common, but in a newborn baby, the liver might not be quite up to speed yet. Uh, it's not running at full capacity because, of course, the newborn has been relying on the mother to do most of those processes before birth. So the baby's uh, liver uh, 
isn't functioning at full capacity and that means that bilirubin is not being removed from the body fast enough. The other way you can get jaundice though is if your red blood cells are breaking down faster than they should be. So let's say that you have malaria or you have yellow fever. Malaria is caused by a protist, which is a little single-celled eukaryote, and yellow fever is caused by a virus. But they both have the same impact. They cause your red blood cells to rupture and dump out lots of hemoglobin. Your liver gets overwhelmed by the waste products of the breakdown of that hemoglobin. So your liver is functioning, but it's being overwhelmed by bilirubin. It can't process it fast enough, and we get the same end result. The pretty colors that we see in a bruise are also the result of the breakdown of hemoglobin. If you bruise yourself, what you've done is you've broken capillary beds. You've broken these fine little vessels that should be conducting blood, but what's happening instead is the blood is leaking out of the capillaries and it's getting trapped in the interstitial spaces between the cells of the tissue. At first, you're gonna see this red and reddish brown coloration. You're seeing the color of the blood itself. Hemoglobin gives blood this reddish color. But what's gonna happen is macrophages are gonna to come to the site and they're gonna gobble up those trapped red blood cells and they're gonna break down that uh, heme group into biliverdin, which is green. And we'll see some greenish coloration. And then that'll be further broken down into bilirubin which is yellow. So this gives us this progression of colors as the bruise is healing. Let's take a look at some erythrocyte disorders and we'll start with the most common, which is anemia. Anemia is where the blood has an abnormally low oxygen carrying capacity. And I need to stress that there are many, many ways that you can arrive at this condition. There's no one cause. We'll talk about a few of them. Before I talked about hypoxia, hypoxia is where you have low oxygen levels in a particular tissue. That, of course, can be caused by anemia, but it could be caused by other things. You could have blood that's functioning fine, but you're suffocating. Uh, that would be a cause of hypoxia that's not related to anemia. If you have anemia, your blood is not transporting enough oxygen, and it may be that some tissues won't have enough oxygen to carry out their normal metabolic functions. Because of that, you may feel very fatigued, you may become very pale, you can have shortness of breath and chills as a result. As mentioned, there are lots of different things that can bring about anemia. We can have hemorrhagic anemia, which is due to the loss of blood. So that could be due to injury or menstruation, for instance. If we lose blood, then of course, we lower the capacity to carry oxygen throughout the body. We can have hemolytic anemia where we have red blood cells that are being damaged prematurely. So as mentioned, there are some diseases and infections that can bring that about. We can have aplastic anemia, which is the destruction of the bone marrow or the inhibition of the activities of the bone marrow. So if we damage the bone marrow, we lose stem cells. We can have iron deficiency. So in this case, your body doesn't have access to sufficient iron to make sufficient hemoglobin. It could be a result of loss of blood, or it could be due to diet. You're not getting enough iron in your diet, or you have an issue where you're not absorbing sufficient iron from your food. So there's something wrong with uh, the receptors and the uh, pumps and channels and so on that would take iron in through the lining of the small intestine, or perhaps there's something wrong with the way the liver is processing iron. We can also have pernicious anemia, which results from a deficiency of vitamin B12. So B12 is very important in activating a number of uh, enzymes, particularly enzymes that are involved in DNA synthesis. B12 is something you can only get from your diet. You can't make it yourself. So if you're not getting enough B12 in your diet or you're not absorbing the B12 in your intestine for some reason, then this is going to impede the production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder that's caused by a mutation in the gene for hemoglobin. 
it's a point mutation that causes this. That means that it's only a single nucleotide that's incorrect. Remember that you are a diploid organism. You got one set of information from your mother and one set from your father. If you have two bad copies of this gene, then you have full-blown sickle cell anemia. If you have one bad copy and one good copy, you have something called sickle cell trait, which is far less devastating. It's uh, far more uh, easily dealt with. So as you know, hemoglobin consists of four polypeptides. Those four polypeptides come together to form a protein. If you have sickle cell anemia, those polypeptides are very slightly misshapen, and the protein that results sticks together and forms these long chains. These long chains of hemoglobin aren't as effective at transporting oxygen, and also they change the shape of the red blood cell. They make the cell sickle or blade shaped. And that causes these red blood cells to become stuck in capillaries, which as you can imagine, is a very bad thing. If you have sickle cell trait, you have one good copy, one bad copy, you're going to have a mixture of normal hemoglobin and misshapen hemoglobin. If two misshapen hemoglobins come together, they will stick together. But as soon as we get a normal hemoglobin added to the chain, nothing will stick to that one. So instead of having these long chains of hemoglobin, we have short chains of hemoglobins. We have cells that are unusual, but they're not nearly as deformed as we see in full-blown sickle cell anemia. Now what's rather interesting is that we find this very uneven distribution of sickle cell anemia throughout the world. And if we look at a map of the distribution of sickle cell anemia, which is what you're seeing here, it coincides with a map of malaria outbreaks. So on this map, blue is uh, rather low frequencies of sickle cell anemia, red is high frequency. The high frequency areas are also areas where malaria is very prevalent. If you have sickle cell trait, or sickle cell anemia for that matter, it offers you protection against malaria. Malaria is the result of, a, of an infection with a little single-celled organism that burrows into the red blood cells, reproduces inside of them, and then causes those cells to rupture. The malaria organism, though, can't deal with misshapen hemoglobin, and it doesn't infect those cells. So with two bad copies of the hemoglobin gene, you're going to have nothing but abnormal hemoglobin in your red blood cells. The cells are going to sickle, they're going to take that blade shape, and that's going to cause them to get stuck. And that may cause blockages and prevent blood from flowing to certain tissues and cause the death of those tissues. So it can cause brain damage and kidney damage and lung damage. Also, those sickle cells are going to be taken out of circulation quite quickly. They're going to be removed and broken down. You're never going to have enough red blood cells, so you're going to suffer from anemia as well. So this is a really debilitating disease. People with sickle cell trait, however, have sufficient normal hemoglobin to still have a rather normal life. As you can see here, if we have two parents that have the sickle cell trait and they have children together, we can end up with some children that receive two good copies and they would have normal hemoglobin, nothing but normal hemoglobin. We can have children that inherit the sickle cell trait, so they have one good copy, one bad copy, and we'll also have children that have two bad copies and have sickle cell anemia. Let's change gears a bit and have a look at blood groups or blood types. Blood groups are determined by the glycoproteins that are displayed on the surfaces of red blood cells. These glycoproteins act as antigens. An antigen is something that can be bound by an antibody. So let's say you receive a blood transfusion and the blood cells within that transfusion have different antigens on them than you have on your blood cells. If you produce antibodies that recognize that antigen, they will stick to that antigen and they'll cause 
these foreign cells to stick to each other. And that's a process known as agglutination. And as you might imagine, that's not something you want to have happen. You don't want blood to agglutinate or form clumps as it's moving through your circulatory system. The blood types that you're probably most familiar with are the ABO system of blood typing. Now I'll just point out that there are many other antigens on red blood cells and we'll, we'll get to those in a bit. But let's take a look at this ABO first. So if you are type A blood, that means your red blood cells display the A antigen and that's the only antigen they display of this ABO system. You're also going to produce anti-B antibodies. You'll produce antibodies that can recognize and bind to B antigens. Now you don't have any B antigens, so that's not a problem for you. If you have type B blood, that means your red blood cells are only displaying the B antigen and you make anti-A antibody. That's an antibody that will bind to the A antigen. Again, not a problem because you don't have any of those A antigens in your body. But as you can probably already work out, if you were type B and you received type A blood, your anti-A antibodies would bind to those antigens and it would cause the cells to stick together. And the reason it causes the cells to stick together is we have several binding sites. So these little notches here are going to bind to the A antigen. So we have lots of them. We have ones over here as well. So this molecule can bind to more than one cell and it can cause the cells to stick together. Now, if you're type AB, that means your cells produce both A and B antigens and you don't produce either antibody. If you're type O, you don't have either of the A or B antigens and you produce both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So if you're type O, you can donate your blood to anyone. It doesn't matter what type they are. There's nothing for their antibodies if they have them to bind to, there won't be any problems. However, if you're type O, you can only receive blood from another type O person. If you received type A blood, your anti-A antibodies would bind to it. If you received type B, your anti-B antibodies would bind to it. If you received AB, all of your antibodies would bind to it. So again, we have two antigens, A and B, that might be present on the surface of red blood cells, and we have two antibodies that might be present in the plasma, anti-A and anti-B. Now I should point out that the antigens A and B are quite simple structures made out of carbohydrate, and these structures are quite common in the world around us. They're found in our food, they're found on pollen grains, they're found um, on bacterial cell walls. So from a very early age, in fact, by the age of one, you have made antibodies against the antigens that you don't have in your own body. Remember that it's very important that we don't transfer blood from a person that has a particular antigen to a person that has the antibodies for that antigen. If we do, we'll get agglutination of the blood and that will cause serious hemolytic reactions as well. Hemolytic reactions are reactions that split the blood cells open or lyse the blood cells. If we perform a bad transfusion and we have the donor cells being attacked by the recipient's antibodies, then we can have diminished oxygen carrying capacity resulting from the agglutinated cells. That's kind of the best case scenario. We can have the clump cells impeding blood flow and causing blockages. We can also have red blood cells rupturing and releasing hemoglobin into the bloodstream. And then that hemoglobin, of course, has to be broken down and those waste products have to be removed. That's going to be done by the kidneys and the kidneys may be overwhelmed by this and that would cause renal failure. So some very serious consequences of getting a transfusion wrong. Testing for blood type is really straightforward. If we were doing this in the lab, we would have either plastic or porcelain plates that have little wells that you can add your samples to and your reagents to. So you're seeing that on the right hand figure. So you can see our first row, we're testing blood type A. 
You've got untreated blood in the first column. This is our negative control to compare our results to. Then we've got this blood that we've treated with anti-A serum. And you can see for blood type A, it agglutinates. So the cells are going to clump together as expected. Treated with anti-B, nothing's gonna happen because there is no B antigen. In the next row, we're testing uh, blood that's blood type B, and you can see that we don't get any agglutination when adding anti-A, but we do get agglutination when adding anti-B. Down the bottom, you can see for O-type, we don't have either of those antigens, so we don't get any kind of reaction using anti-A or anti-B. And as you probably guessed, the row that is not labeled there is AB. We get agglutination if we add either anti-A or anti-B. Now on the left side of this slide, it's showing you the genetics of blood typing. And they're using a big A for the A allele, and a big B for the B allele, and a big O for the recessive O allele. Now, it's okay if you wanna do it that way. That's not the way I would write it. So I'll show you the way I would write an example like this. So I would recommend that you use an uppercase I for the dominant alleles that code for the antigen A and the antigen B, and then use a lowercase i for the recessive allele that doesn't code for an antigen. So for example, with type A blood, this could be a dominant allele. So I've used a uppercase I with a superscript A and a recessive allele. So we've got an individual here that of course is diploid. They've got one dominant allele, one recessive allele. But this individual could also have two dominant alleles. For type B, the same thing. We could have an individual that has one dominant allele for the B antigen and then one recessive allele. Again, the dominant allele is gonna be expressed over the recessive allele. Or this individual, if we didn't know any better, could also have two dominant forms of the uh, allele for the B antigen. Type AB, there's only one way that that could occur, and that's if we have the two co-dominant alleles, one for the A antigen, one for the B antigen. And type O, there's only one way that that could occur, and that's if we have the two recessive alleles that don't code for an antigen. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say that we were going to cross these two individuals. So we have these two heterozygous individuals. One is type B, one is type A, but they both have one of those recessive alleles as well. And if we did a Punnett square, we would represent that like this. Remember, what you're doing with a Punnett square is you're showing the possible genotypes of the gametes that are gonna to come together to form a zygote and form a new individual. So if we did this cross, these are the different outcomes that we could get. So you can see from this, we have a 25% chance of getting an individual that has blood type AB, 25% chance of getting someone who has blood type A, 25% chance of someone who has blood type B, and a 25% chance of someone who is type O. Be aware that there are lots of antigens found on red blood cells in humans. We've talked about ABO. Another really important one is the RH set of factors. The ABO and the RH blood groups cause vigorous reactions if we have a mistake during a transfusion. But there are other antigens that aren't as important and don't create these really strong reactions. M, N, Duffy, Cal, Lewis, and many others. These can be important sometimes for criminal cases, if you're investigating crime scene, or if you're trying to figure out paternity, for instance. We'll talk in a bit more detail about the RH factor, because as mentioned, this is important when it comes to transfusions. There are several different RH antigens, but only three of them are common, C, D, and E. If you have an RH antigen, displayed on your cells, we say that you are RH positive. If you don't, you're RH negative. Now, one thing that differs between RH and ABO is that you don't develop antibodies to RH unless your blood is directly exposed to the RH antigen.
So you have to come in direct contact with it before you will produce those antibodies. So let's say you've never had any contact with it and you receive blood from someone who has the RH antigen and you don't. You won't have an immediate response, but you will make antibodies from having that initial contact. The next time you come into contact with that blood though, you will have a strong response because you'll have those antibodies and you'll have populations of the plasma cells in your body that produce those antibodies. RH antibodies are much smaller than anti-A and anti-B antibodies. And for this reason, they can cross the placenta, whereas anti-A and anti-B generally can't. This can create problems in an expectant mother. So if we have a mother that has been exposed to RH antigens in the past, she will have produced antibodies towards that RH factor. The antibodies, like I said, can cross the placenta and cause problems for the baby because they can attack the blood cells within the baby and lice or break those cells. So how might this happen? Well, imagine a scenario where we have a mother that's RH negative. She's never been exposed to the RH antigen before, and she doesn't have any antibodies against it. She has a baby inside her that is RH positive. Now, this isn't a problem because the baby's blood isn't going to cross the placenta and mix with her blood, and she doesn't have any antibodies that will attack the baby's red blood cells. So everything goes fine, but at the end of the pregnancy, during delivery, of course, there is a lot of bleeding and tearing and so on. The placenta is constructed by both the mother and the baby. So one half is made by the mother, the other half is made by the baby, and the placenta may tear during birth. So there's likely to be some mixing of blood from the two people during the birthing process. So the mother's blood is exposed to the baby's blood, and the mother starts making antibodies towards the RH factor. Now let's say she has another pregnancy. And during this pregnancy, there's a problem because during this pregnancy, she has anti-RH antibodies. Those antibodies can cross the placenta and they can attack the baby's blood cells. So of course that could be a major issue. This is something known as hemolytic disease of newborns. Now there are ways to treat this. There are um, basically medications that act as blockers against these antibodies. You can also do transfusions of plasma that's free of antibodies into the mother. You can do transfusions directly into the baby that bypass contributions from the mother as well. So there are ways to deal with this scenario. Let's leave red blood cells behind and look at leukocytes or white blood cells. They're far less numerous than red blood cells. So they make up only 1% of the total blood volume. What's interesting about white blood cells is that they're capable of extra vasation, which means they can leave the circulatory system. They can leave capillaries and wander into tissues. This is something that red blood cells don't do. Now, if you have a bacterial or viral invasion, you will have a higher white blood cell count. If a tissue becomes infected, macrophages within the tissue will release signaling molecules known as cytokines. And these cytokines will essentially invite other leukocytes to join the party. What they do is they cause the endothelial cells, the squamous epithelial cells that make up the wall of the capillary to release adhesion molecules. So adhesion molecules that have been packed away in vesicles will move to the surface, embed themselves within the plasma membrane, and stick to any leukocytes that might flow by in the blood. So the leukocytes are stuck to the walls of the capillary. They slow down and roll along the walls until they're able to sneak through the gaps between the endothelial cells and enter into the tissue. We have about 4,000 to 11,000 white blood cells per microliter of blood. Now that's gonna vary person to person. It's also gonna depend on whether or not you're fighting an infection. 
Of these white blood cells, neutrophils are the most common, followed by lymphocytes, followed by monocytes, followed by eosinophils, and then basophils. And we'll go through and talk about each of these in turn. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils make up a larger group of white blood cells known as granulocytes. These cells contain granules within their cytoplasm that contain material that stains quite darkly. All of the photos that I'm going to show you contain cells that have been stained with Wright's stain. Wright's stain is the most commonly used stain to identify different types of white blood cells. Wright's stain contains eosin, which is a red acidic dye, and methylene blue, which is a blue non-acidic dye. Remember that an acid is something that will give up hydrogen protons and become negative if you place it in water. So eosin has a negative charge, methylene blue has a positive charge, and these dyes will stick to things that have the opposite charge. Granulocytes are larger and shorter lived than red blood cells. They have lobed nuclei, and all of them are capable of taking in debris or foreign cells like bacteria by phagocytosis. Neutrophils are the most abundant granulocytes and the most abundant white blood cells in the blood. They react strongly to both acidic and basic dyes. So they contain granules that will absorb these charged dyes and give the cytoplasm a purple color. Note that the nucleus also stains quite darkly and you can see it's rather oddly shaped. It's got these lobes to it. The granules contain peroxidases and hydrolytic enzymes, which will help break down materials that have been brought into the cell through phagocytosis. The granules also contain defensins. Defensins are amphipathic molecules that can embed themselves into the plasma membrane and cell wall membranes of bacteria. So you can see in the bottom right here that we have these defensins that have a hydrophilic end that interacts with the phospholipid head. And then we have a hydrophobic end that interacts with the core of the bacterial membrane. Once these things embed themselves into the membrane, the hydrophobic regions come together and cause holes to form within the membrane. Now at this point, the bacterium can't control what gets in and what gets out. It's got this great big gaping hole that allows materials to flow without any selection going on. As you can imagine, the bacterial cell can't maintain homeostasis under these conditions and it's going to die. Neutrophils are very effective at killing bacteria and that is their main function. Eosinophils only account for one to 4% of the white blood cells in your blood. They're very clearly and easily distinguished from other white blood cells. First of all, the nucleus is bilobed. It has two lobes to it. That's different from neutrophils. Neutrophils usually have nuclei that have very odd shapes and may have several lobes to them. Also, you'll notice that the cytoplasm stains red. And that's because we've got very, very coarse granules that are acetophilic they bind to acidic dyes. And the acidic dye they're binding here is eosin. Also note that we've got this very kind of pixelated or granular appearance to the cytoplasm, and that's because these granules are quite large. Eosinophils attack multicellular parasites. They pull antigens off of the surface of these parasites and display them to the immune system so that other cells of the immune system can also initiate a response towards these parasites. Another interesting thing they do is they lessen the severity of allergies. So if you have an allergy, your immune system is responding to something that it shouldn't. So for instance, proteins on the surface of a pollen grain are acting as antigens, they're being recognized by antibodies, and they're being identified as something dangerous, when of course they're not. And you're eliciting this immune response. What eosinophils do is they recognize where we have this massive attack 
that's being directed towards something non-harmful and they get rid of those complexes. So if we have an allergic reaction, we tend to have these complexes of other white blood cells and antibodies and other components of the complement system, something we'll talk about later, that bind together and form this great big kind of blob of material. And eosinophils will remove that before this brings about further increases in the immune response. In developed countries, we don't have a lot of multicellular parasites. They tend to be quite rare. In many parts of the world, they are still quite common. And if you look at wild animals, or if you look at humans hundreds of years ago, multicellular parasites were the norm. And a lot of people have suggested that we've seen sort of an explosion in allergies and autoimmune disorders in our recent human history in developed countries because we don't have as many eosinophils as we should because we don't have multi multicellular parasites living inside of us. There's been some research that suggested that some disorders like autism, for instance, might actually be autoimmune disorders where the immune system is attacking antigens on the surface of nerve cells. And there's been some interesting research where people have taken hookworms, which are small uh, multicellular parasites, and they've put small numbers of them into individuals that have autoimmune disorders, and they found that this increases the number of eosinophils and it decreases autoimmune responses and allergic reactions. Basophils only account for about 5% of white blood cells. They're the least abundant white blood cells. They generally have a U or S-shaped nucleus, but you're unlikely to be able to distinguish it. And the reason for that is because they also contain a lot of large, very darkly staining granules. These granules contain histamine. Histamine is an inflammatory compound. What that means is it causes blood vessels to dilate, so increase in size, and bring more blood to the area. So if these basophils are flowing through a capillary and they find themselves in an area where there's an infection occurring or where there's damaged tissues, they'll release histamine that increases blood flow to the area and that means that more platelets can get there to cause a blood clot to stop blood loss or to release platelet-derived growth factor and bring about healing of the tissue. Also, if we have increased blood flow to an area, we get more antibodies, more leukocytes, etc., arriving at the scene of the crime to help destroy any foreign cells, any bacterial cells, etc. These cells are very similar to mast cells. The one big difference, of course, is location. Mast cells are found within tissues. They're found wandering around within the skin, within connective tissue, and within epithelial tissue. The next major category of white blood cells would be the A granulocytes. Again, remember if you see A at the beginning of a word, it means without. So these cells lack granules. Here we're talking about lymphocytes and monocytes. So they don't have any visible cytoplasmic granules. Their vesicles and so on are quite small. They're all structurally similar, but we do see functionally different cell types. They can have spherical or kidney-shaped nuclei. Lymphocytes account for a little more than 25% of the white blood cells. They have a very large nucleus. It takes up most of the cell. Around that, they have a thin layer of cytoplasm that stains a very light blue. And notice that there are no granules in that cytoplasm. There are two types of lymphocytes. We have T cells and B cells. T cells are going to regulate immune responses. B cells give rise to plasma cells, which are the cells that produce antibodies. That's all we're going to talk about this for now, but we will come back to this in a lot more detail in microbiology. So if you're taking Biology 105 with me later, be prepared for that. Monocytes account for 4 to 8% of leukocytes or white blood cells. They're the largest of the leukocytes, and they're fairly easy to distinguish from other leukocytes 
First of all, they have a kidney-shaped or U-shaped nucleus. They have more cytoplasm than we see in the lymphocytes. And also, once again, they don't have granules visible within the cytoplasm. They can leave the circulation, so sneak through gaps within the walls of capillaries, enter into tissues, and once they're there, they differentiate into macrophages, which actively wander around and gobble up debris and foreign cells. Okay, pop quiz, let's see if you can identify these white blood cells. You can stop the PowerPoint, take a moment to write down your answers, and I'll be right back to give those to you. I'm back. Okay, so A is a neutrophil. How do we know that? Well, first of all, you can see granules in the cytoplasm. So it's got this really kind of rough texture to it. It's a granulocyte. Also, we've got a very oddly shaped nucleus. We can see this really, really thin constriction in the nucleus. And I should point out that this doesn't have more than one nucleus. It's one nucleus, it's just very oddly shaped. B is an eosinophil. We have a bilobed nucleus. It looks like there's two nuclei, but there is actually a thin strand connecting them. Also, the cytoplasm stains red, and it's very coarse. We have very large granules within the cytoplasm. C is a basophil. It's difficult to see the nucleus because the granules are very large and they stain very darkly. So the top three here are all granulocytes. On the bottom, D is a lymphocyte. We've got a very large nucleus that almost completely fills the cell. All we can see is a thin little layer of cytoplasm at the top. And if you look closely, it's not really granulated. And then finally, we've got a monocyte, very large cell. It's got a large nucleus, but it doesn't completely fill the cell. We do have a fairly obvious thicker layer of cytoplasm around the outside. Leukocytes are formed within red bone marrow. We start off with hemocytoblasts, which remember are stem cells. They differentiate into two populations of cells, myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. Myeloid stem cells are gonna become myeloblasts or monoblasts. Lymphoid stem cells become lymphoblasts. Myeloblasts develop into eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils, whereas monoblasts give rise to monocytes. Lymphoblasts develop into lymphocytes. Once again, I don't expect you to know all the different stages that are presented here. I want you to know that hemocytoblasts are stem cells that can give rise to all the different types of blood cells. I want you to know that they differentiate into myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. I also want you to know that monocytes develop into macrophages and lymphocytes give rise to plasma cells. And that's the level of detail that I think is enough for our purposes. I talked about leukemia before, but I wanna go back and look at it in a bit more detail. Leukemia is the result of cancer within red bone marrow. And remember, this is where we have stem cells that give rise to the different types of blood cells. We have different types of leukemia named after the population of stem cells that are affected. We have myelocytic leukemia that involves the myeloblasts. We have lymphocytic leukemia that involves the lymphoblasts. Remember that cancer is a result of mutation. We have mutation in genes that are involved in regulating the cell cycle. If they're not working, the cell divides uncontrollably. Normally cells need to have outside signals to tell them to divide, but cancer cells ignore those signals. So if for instance we have one of these mutations in a myeloblast, then that myeloblast is going to divide uncontrollably. And in perhaps a very short period of time, we might end up with a lot of these defective myeloblasts. They're going to overwhelm, they're gonna dominate the population of myeloblasts within the bone marrow. They will produce a lot of cells, but the cells they produce are defective. 
they can't perform the functions that we expect of them. Acute leukemia is leukemia that develops very rapidly. This tends to be more common in children, and it's thought to relate to mutations that happen prior to birth. It's also thought to be more common in children that are not exposed to pathogens very early on that might otherwise prime their immune system. Chronic leukemia is more prevalent in older individuals. Individuals with leukemia generate lots of white blood cells. In fact, if you look at a slide of their blood, and you might have had a chance to do that in the lab, we do have these slides, you would have seen that there's lots and lots of white blood cells, more than you would expect, but they're not mature. They don't look quite right. The bone marrow within an individual that has leukemia can be overwhelmed by cancerous leukocytes. And the white blood cells that are produced, although there's a lot of them, they're not functional. People that die of leukemia die from internal hemorrhage, internal bleeding, or they die from infection. So they can get a simple infection that other people would be able to fight off, but because they don't have a large population of functional white blood cells, they can't deal with it. Treatments for leukemia include irradiation, same sort of treatment we might use for other cancer cells, anti-leukemic drugs, so essentially chemotherapy, and also bone marrow transplants. So we can take bone marrow from a healthy, close relative and transfer that into the bone of someone who is suffering from leukemia. What that's gonna do is it's going to transplant some healthy stem cells into the bone. We have to use a very close genetic match because hopefully that individual that's donating the cells will have the same glycoproteins displayed on the surface of their cells and the recipient will not attack those cells. The immune system of the leukemia patient will not destroy the cells that we transfer. Gene therapy also holds some promise. So this is a fairly new technology, but what we can do is we can take cells out of the bone marrow, take stem cells specifically out of the bone marrow, fix the problem gene, take those cells, grow them up in cell culture, and then re-inject them back into the leukemia patient. The last formed element that we haven't talked about yet are platelets. Platelets are fragments of cells. They're fragments of large cells known as megakaryocytes that are formed within the bone marrow. There's lots of them. So we have 150 to 400,000 per microliter of blood. And they're also quite small. They have a very short lifespan. They don't have a nucleus because they are cell fragments, but they do contain vesicles that are filled with some rather important materials. Their primary function is to promote hemostasis, which is the reduction of blood loss at the site of a wound. They also promote healing, so they can release factors that will cause nearby cells to undergo mitosis divide and replace damaged cells. So again, platelets are fragments of cells. They contain granules, and those granules contain a bunch of things, platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF, calcium, enzymes, and a whole lot of other signaling molecules. Platelets function in the production of a temporary plug that hopefully can plug the hole made by a wound and prevent blood loss. We have a few steps involved in that. We have adhesion where the platelets are going to stick to the endothelium. The endothelium is the layer of squamous cells that lines the inside of a blood vessel. Next we have activation and this is where the platelet increases in size to better fill that hole. So platelets as they're roaming around in the blood have a very wrinkled surface. Let me draw you a terrible diagram. So we have a platelet that is moving around in the blood and it's got this very, very wrinkled surface to it. So the membrane has a large surface area, but this platelet has been kind of squished. During activation, what's gonna happen is all of those wrinkles are gonna stretch out. 
we're going to end up with a much larger structure. And that larger structure is now better able to plug the hole. Platelets stick to endothelium, but they also become sticky enough that they can stick to each other as well. So platelets that arrive at this wound will stick to each other and fill that damage and prevent blood flow. Now you don't want sticky platelets ballooning up and moving around in the blood, sticking to endothelium and causing a blood clot where there's no damage. That would be a big problem. Healthy cells, healthy endothelial cells are constantly producing prostacyclin. And prostacyclin tells the platelets to do absolutely nothing. If we have endothelial cells that become damaged, they stop producing prostacyclin. And if platelets stop receiving that signal, they do their thing. They become sticky and they expand so that they can plug up the hole that's present in that area. Thrombosis is the formation of blood clots in blood vessels. An embolus is when one of these blood clots detaches from the endothelium and roams freely in the blood. And as you can imagine, that's a problem because it may become lodged within a healthy, healthy capillary somewhere else and prevent blood flow past that clot. Hemostasis is the term given to the process that brings about the stoppage or reduction of bleeding. And hemostasis can be broken down into three phases. So we have a blood vessel, a capillary, being damaged. And immediately what's going to happen is something known as vascular spasm. This is where smooth muscle within the capillary is going to constrict, constrict the blood vessel and reduce blood flow to that damaged area. The next thing that's going to happen is that platelets are going to come together and form a plug. So they'll form a physical barrier at the site of damage. After that, this plug is going to form a clot and this involves the production of a protein known as fibrin which will form this sort of fibrous network that binds everything together into a blood clot. Vascular spasm is the rapid constriction of very fine blood vessels, arterioles and capillaries. So the arterioles and capillaries are surrounded by a thin sheet of involuntary smooth muscle that is going to contract and that will constrict the blood vessels and limit blood loss. This happens immediately after damage, and it doesn't persist for very long. It'll give platelets in the damaged area enough time to start the processes that will bring about blood clotting. As mentioned, platelets by default don't stick to each other and don't stick to endothelium. If they did, that would cause problems. Instead, they only do these things when they find themselves in an area where there's damage. So if there's damage to endothelium, platelets will bring about a whole series of responses. They're going to interact with blood glycoproteins, so glycoproteins that are just floating around in the blood. Those proteins will become activated, they'll stick to each other, and they'll stick to the platelets. They're also going to interact with collagen fibers. And this is really the interaction that gets the ball rolling and gets things going. So we have in capillaries, these thin squamous cells that make up the endothelium. And on the outside of those cells, we have a thick extracellular matrix with lots of collagen that forms this structural component. If the endothelium is damaged, the collagen is going to be exposed to the blood. It's not normally. So platelets, if they come into contact with collagen, they'll bind to it. It's not something they should normally come into contact with. And that will start this whole cascade of events. One thing that the platelets will do is they'll release serotonin. Serotonin is a signaling molecule. You've probably heard of it before, although you've probably heard of its function as a neurotransmitter. But serotonin in this case is going to promote vasodilation. That's going to increase blood flow to the area to bring in more platelets and bring in more white blood cells that can help attack the uh, pathogens that may be present as well.
Also, we're going to have the release of something known as thromboxane A2, which is going to stimulate nearby platelets. Platelets can release this thromboxane, they can release serotonin, but they also have receptors for these two things. So we might have one platelet starting to release these compounds, and then all the nearby platelets are going to be stimulated as well, and they're going to release more of these signaling molecules, and they're going to start doing a whole bunch of other things to bring about a blood clot. Now the other important thing to note is that this whole series of events is going to be regulated by the presence of prostacyclin. If prostacyclin is present in the area, these things don't happen. And remember that prostacyclin is produced by healthy, undamaged cells. Coagulation is the process by which rather non-viscous fluid blood is converted into a very, very viscous gel. And coagulation is gonna follow intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. An intrinsic pathway is something that involves factors that are already found in the blood. So it involves proteins and activators and so on that are already floating around in the blood or contained within platelets. Extrinsic pathways involve the damaged tissue. So tissue that is damaged may start releasing factors that will bring about coagulation or enhance coagulation. And at the same time, damaged tissues stop producing compounds that would normally shut these pathways down. This is a very complex set of interactions and reactions. There are hundreds of compounds involved, but we're just gonna look at the very basics here. We have an activator known as prothrombin, and this is something that is normally inactive. It's going to be converted into thrombin. And within the blood, thrombin will catalyze the joining of fibrinogen into a mesh made out of fibrin. Remember when we talked about enzymes of the digestive system, we talked about how they're usually created in an inactive form known as a zymogen. So something like pepsinogen, for instance, that's not active in the cell that creates it. When it's released into the environment where it's going to do its thing, it changes. It's going to be refolded or a little bit of it's going to be cut off. It's going to finally take its active form. So pepsin in that example, same thing with fibrinogen. So fibrinogen is a glycoprotein that's floating around in the blood and it's soluble. So it stays suspended within the blood. But if it's acted upon by th um, thrombin, it will turn into something called fibrin, which is not soluble. It's insoluble. And this fibrin protein will settle out and then it will be stuck together or cross-linked by other enzymes. Another thing that platelets contain is calcium. The calcium will be released in a damaged area that activates a bunch of other signaling molecules and enzymes that can get to work on this fibrin, stick it together to form kind of like a net that the platelets can stick to. So again, there's a lot of stuff here I don't expect you to know. I want you to know that the platelets and the blood itself contain inactive proteins that are just waiting to be activated. And they're going to be activated by damaged tissues and also by the presence of collagen. So remember, collagen surrounds the outside of a capillary. It surrounds the uh, endothelium, that layer of thin squamous cells, it's not usually exposed to the blood. But if platelets come into contact with collagen, they will start releasing signaling molecules and bringing about all these changes. Incidentally, you can see that I've got one of these factors there highlighted, factor X. Uh, it's not actually a factor that's unknown. That's not what the X means. It's factor 10. So we're talking about Roman numerals here. There are dozens of factors that are involved in this entire process. But once again, what I want you to know is that platelets, if they see collagen, if they bind to collagen and recognize it, they will bring about changes that are enhanced by damaged tissue. And these changes will activate otherwise inactive molecules, including enzymes. And the end result is 
is to take fibrinogen from the blood, convert it into fibrin, stick the fibrin together into a net that the platelets can stick to. So we start with a blood vessel that's been damaged. Notice that we have collagen shown as these dark lines on the outside of the endothelium. And we have a break right here. And now collagen, and collagen again is represented by these dark fibers. Collagen is exposed to the blood. That doesn't usually happen. These platelets bind to the collagen. The collagen is very sticky to a platelet. It has receptors that will bind to collagen. And once those receptors bind to the collagen, that brings about changes in the platelets. The platelets will start to release all that stuff that's stored within them. Now that platelets have bound to collagen, they'll start releasing serotonin and thromboxin A2 and a whole bunch of other signaling molecules. And that's gonna cause all the other platelets in the area that would have otherwise just floated by to also become activated and to become sticky, to stick to endothelium and also to stick to other platelets. These signaling molecules also activate enzymes and other compounds within the blood that are involved in taking fibrinogen, converting it into fibrin, sticking the fibrin together and sticking that to the platelets. I should also mention that the platelets also release ADP. And we've talked a lot about ADP because of course it's converted into ATP, but ADP can also serve as a signaling molecule. Is there anything ADP can't do? Well, anyway, ADP is normally found inside cells. Cells hang on to it, they turn it into ATP, they break it down into ADP, they recycle it over and over and over again. And generally, most of the tissues in your body recognize that if ADP is floating around outside of a cell, something's gone wrong, because that means that a cell has broken down. So this can actually be used as a signaling molecule for damage. But in this case, the platelets release it intentionally to tell the cells in the area that there is damage. There's a frenzy of activity in the platelets now. They're releasing all these signaling compounds. Damaged tissue is releasing compounds as well. Any new platelets that come to the area are going to be grabbed onto and pulled into this developing plug. And the plug is gonna get larger and larger and larger. And here's a nice little overview of that. So we have our very thin endothelial layer of cells. We have a thick layer of collagen underneath that. And then we have our smooth muscle. And we can see that we have damage here that's exposed the collagen to the blood. A platelet comes along, it binds to that. And then what happens next is it releases signaling molecules that tell other platelets in the area to start doing their thing and releasing signaling molecules. So very, very quickly, this small response binding to collagen turns into a big response. And now we have enzymes that are breaking down fibrinogen into fibrin, sticking that together and using that to stick the platelets together. Here we have an early stage in the formation of a blood clot. Notice that our fibrin threads aren't just catching platelets, they're also catching red blood cells at this point. So we're gonna turn the fluid of the blood into a gel and then basically turn that into a wall. We've put up this big net, we've caught platelets, the platelets have expanded in size and now we're catching red blood cells as well. And here we have a red blood cell that's being caught in the net, almost like a fish in a net. After a plug has formed, it contracts. This is an active contraction of the plug. So we have additional cross-linking of the fibrin molecules. The fibrin molecules come closer together. That causes the plug to shrink. Now remember, the plug is going to be attached to damaged tissue. So it's going to attach to both sides of a gap within a blood vessel. And as the clot contracts, it pulls the ends of the gap closer together and reduces the size of the gap in the blood vessel. Once we have this plug in place and hopefully have stopped blood loss, 
we now have to go about repairing the area. Platelet-derived growth factor, which we've talked about several times, is released by platelets, and that's going to stimulate endothelial cells to divide. Remember that the cells in your body for most tissues are generally being told don't divide, it's not your time to divide. But now they're being given the go ahead to divide. The endothelial cells will divide and they'll divide until they touch each other again, which means that the gap, the hole in the blood vessel is gone and then they'll stop. Fibroblasts within the area are also gonna be stimulated they're going to start producing new collagen, they're gonna start producing new connective tissue to fix any of the damage that occurred just outside of the endothelial cells. We have several other factors that are released. Vascular endothelial growth factor stimulates the endothelial cells specifically. And the end result of all of this is to repair the damage and to replace the cells that have been lost. A clot that develops through the processes we've just talked about is known as a thrombus. A thrombus is a clot that forms in situ. It forms at the site of damage. That clot needs to be removed. So after we've prevented excessive blood loss and the tissue has started to heal, that thrombosis should break down, but that doesn't always happen. If it stays there and it blocks the entire blood vessel, it's going to seriously cut off the flow of oxygen and nutrients to tissues that are downstream and they might die. A coronary thrombosis is where we have um, a thrombosis forming within one of the blood vessels that feeds oxygen and nutrients to heart muscle cells. And that can cause a cardiac infraction, a heart attack. An embolus is where one of these thrombi detaches itself and starts moving through the bloodstream. That can be rather serious because it could get lodged in a small blood vessel and who knows where that might happen. If it happens in one of the blood vessels leading to the lungs, that's known as a pulmonary embolism. And that can result in oxygenated blood not getting to parts of the body. We can also have an embolism within blood vessels that feed the brain. That's called a cerebral embolism, and that can cause strokes because it's going to result in the death of patches of tissue within the brain. Another disorder that's important to mention is hemophilia. Hemophilia is where the blood doesn't clot. So you can get a fairly minor injury or even a nosebleed that doesn't clot that can become very serious. You can lose a lot of blood quite rapidly. There's a number of different genetic mutations that can bring this about. So remember I mentioned there's hundreds of compounds that are involved in clotting. Some of the really important ones are thromboxane A2, uh, several of the factors, factor eight, factor 10, etc. If you have a mutation in one of the genes that codes for that protein, then you might not be able to clot your blood very effectively. And as mentioned, that is a rather serious situation. We of course want blood to clot in areas that are damaged, but we don't want it to clot anywhere else. That can result in some rather serious medical conditions. Patients that have a propensity for blood clotting can be given a number of different compounds that are known as blood thinners. And blood thinners reduce the amount of clotting. Note that they're not really thinning the blood per se. A really common one is aspirin. Now you probably know aspirin as a pain reliever. Aspirin is something that inhibits the activity of thromboxin A2. Now thromboxin A2 does a few things. One of the things it does that we haven't really talked about is it serves as a vasodilator. It causes blood vessels to dilate so that more blood can get, ideally, to a damaged area. Now, if we have more blood flow to an area, then we have more blood pressure, we have fluid seeping out of capillaries into tissue, into the interstitial space between cells, and that pressure activates pain receptors. So this is how aspirin works as a pain reliever. However, as we've already talked about, thromboxane A2 also brings about coagulation. So we can 
administer aspirin to prevent unnecessary clotting. Heparin is another well-known blood thinner or anticoagulant, and what it does is it activates inhibitors of thrombin, and thrombin is another signaling compound that brings about coagulation. Warfarin is used in individuals that have atrial fibrillation. That's an unusual contraction of the atria of the heart that tends to result in blood pooling within the atria and coagulation. And this is going to inhibit the recycling of vitamin K1, which is a vitamin that's needed by some of the enzymes that are involved in coagulation. And finally, our terminology list. Wow, that was a long one. And finally, our terminology list. Wow, that was a long one.